senior citizens arts festival is in progress at the Fort Des Moines Hotel in Des Moines. One of the individuals that's participating is retired Dr. Fred Bunker from Toledo, Iowa. He's a retired dentist, isn't he? Right. How long ago did you retire? Uh, well, I haven't retired completely. Semi-retired, we'll okay. say. I extract and make plates, and that's all. Now, nope. No fillies, anything like that. You make other things, such as these canes, too. Oh, yeah. How did you get started doing that? Well, I have, I've contended that everybody should have a hobby. And, uh, many, many years I've been at this. Various things. I've, uh, inventing is a hobby of mine. I hold 13 patents from the United States Patent Office. Only one of them has ever, gave me, uh, has ever done anything for me. But it's just ideas that, that come to your brain and you develop them. You'll see something and you'll, you'll ask, well, how can I improve on this? You may have a, a fork. Now, how could I improve on that? Or a knife? Or something that you, is hard for you to do you see, now how could I improve on that? Now, as far as the canes are concerned, your wife uh, was going to need a cane That's after right. being in Rochester. That's right. She was uh, she was bow-legged. She had her legs straightened, and I tried every place to find a nice cane for her. I couldn't find a cane for her. A nice-looking one. She's a very dainty little gal. She didn't want to carry one of these uh, crooked... You know mm -hmm. what I mean? They're too heavy. So I built her this, I, I made her a cane. And one night about, oh, two o'clock in the morning, she almost fell. She couldn't find her crutches, she couldn't find the cane. And she almost fell in the hallway. Well, I told her, said to myself, well, I'll do something about that. That's how I happened to put this, this flashlight in, uh -huh. in this cane. And she, she go out at night. And a lot of your elderly people, they can't see right. And at night, they put their flashlight on, they hold this down to the curb, and they can see where they're, they're stepping uh -huh. to, save them, to save them a fall. Because invariably, if you fall and break a hip, sometimes that's fatal to you, to the older people. And all a cane is for is to just to, to get you, keep you balanced. I've made these light so they don't have to, they don't weigh very much. It's easy to carry them around. Not only that, if they have, if they have a, oh, some money that they don't want these drug addicts to steal, and they just take out the, put the money in here, and nobody, there's nobody going to be so low as to steal an old lady's cane. So let them have their billfold and save your money. And it's, a, it's a, just a unique idea. Yes. And uh, Now, on this one, you have... Yeah, that's right. Most of your canes, if the handle is a, is a curved handle, they can, they can hang that over their arm. This is a little... They can't do that, so I put this gold chain on. They put it around the wrist, and they have this for hand to do things with. That's why I have this light. So it isn't, it isn't necessary to have a, a real heavy cane. Now, do you sell these? Oh, yes. I, it's, I sell them. And it's just as a hobby. And you can't make any. I don't, I don't aim to make any money out of them or anything like that. It's just for, well, they're just handy. Now, there's another invention that you had, or perhaps adaptation, that I'd like to talk to you about. I understand that in your background, there was an old Packard hearse. That's right. Oh, it's been 25, 30 years ago. I was always driven Packards. And one evening, a gentleman came to me and said that he wanted to sell me a, sell me a car. Well, I said, no, I've got three of them now. Well, she says, this is different. Well, I says, what's different about it? Well, he says, it's a hearse. I got to thinking just for a minute, and I says, uh, well, I'll come over tomorrow and look at it. So I, the next day, I went over, and 
looked at it and drove it down the road for a couple of three miles and came back and I says, how much do you want for this hearse? He says, $65. Well, I says, I'll take it. I didn't have nerve enough to drive it home in the daytime, so I drove it home at night. And when I drove that home, you should have heard my wife. She said, what in the world are you going to do with that? I said, well, you know how expensive it is to be taken out the cemetery. I, I says, we have our own transportation. Oh, she says, you're crazy, you're nuts. I said, yes, I am. I took the body off and I built a trailer house on it. It's probably the, the, the only vehicle in the whole world like it at that time. We drove it to Texas, lived in it for uh, over a month, just about 20 feet from the Gulf of Mexico shore. We had lots of fun. It had twin beds, it had cooking yes, it facilities, had, it, it, had it had... It had twin beds, it had uh, closets in it, it had a stove, and uh, it was uh, lit for uh, 110, and lights for your car, so you was always had lights, and uh, I had a gun case in it, and my fishing poles, and refrigerator, and everything. Uh, convenient that the home has except the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the only thing. <laughs> that's the only thing I didn't have. And this is just a glimpse at some of the people that participated in the Iowa Senior Citizens Arts Festival that was held at the Hotel Fort Des Moines. Uh, retired, semi-retired, Dr. Fred Bunker is from Toledo, Iowa, and particularly here we've been talking about his canes, but also perhaps one of the first campers that's been around. And right. thank you very much. Thank you. This has been lots of fun. Oh, good. Good. <laughs> Of course, my favorite clown is this dear soul. You never love, what's her name? Arabia. She's out. Now, the, looking closely, I think she has a problem. And uh, we're talking to Geraldine Hurst from uh, Atomo. She is participating in the Iowa Senior Citizens Arts Festival. And oh, who inspired this one? Well, I just uh, got up one morning, wasn't feeling too good with my hair all a mess, and so I just started and created her. <laughs> now, when did you start making clowns? In uh, January, the last of January. Father Sigurd at uh, St. Joseph Hospital in Atuma started me out. He said, Geraldine, I think you can make these, and he brought a clown up for me to start on. And so from then on, I've really got clowns all over the country. Now, how do you get the inspiration, and then do you use patterns, or how do you carry it out? No, there are no patterns. They are all original. Each and every one is made from scratch. I cut the feet. I cut the features and everything from felt, and they're glued onto a styrofoam ball. Of course, the styrofoam ball is first covered with a sock, and the body is made from a two-by-four, or from a detergent bottle and fastened on with the sock and the head. That way it makes it real solid. And then your piece of material, it takes you about three-fourths of a yard to make the clown's body and everything. But, of course, the outward experience, uh, appearance is... Yes. It's all inspirational. I do it from scratch. And I don't know myself how the clown is going to look until I put the last dot on him. <laughs> well, what is there about a clown, though? What, a how clown, does a clown work? A clown is a cover-up for what is on the inside. He may be a happy clown, but as a rule, they're not very happy, but they like to make people happy. And so they're always laughing and trying to make the other person happy. And then in that way, why they have happiness themselves. Now, how old are you? I'll be 70 Thursday. <laughs> I never thought I'd ever live this long, but here I am, <laughs> and able to walk 
What does your apartment look like with all these materials? It looks just about like this here table of clowns. <laughs> but what about the materials? Where do you get the materials? Well, I have a lot of material. As I say, my apartment is pretty crowded, but I have all my materials there, and I just pick up a piece of uh, material, and I decide that's what I'm going to make a clown out of. Then I go ahead and finish the rest of it. Now, I think some people think that they never can be creative. What are some of the ingredients of such? Well, uh, first of all, you have to do it, want to do it. And then in that way, wanting to do something uh, inspires you to uh, go ahead and do it. And then when you've created your first clown, you're so thrilled about it. And then you keep going on and on and on. I've made probably 100 clowns and no two alike. So you see, there is no pattern. But of course, uh, other people can copy things, of which I can't. But they can copy them, so they could take any one of these clowns and copy them and have them look like that clown. Let's take a little peek at some of your clowns. Yes. Now this little little boy, he's a real nice little clown. And he just uh, is real young, you know. His father was a big clown, so he's going to be following his father's footsteps. So he has a drum, and he said, you want to play my drum? And I think he's real cute. And this one over here, he's, he feels a little bit sad, but he says, I'm, I'm not sad. I just look that way. So see? And then this one down here, I think, is a real cute little clown. He says, I've got to watch the kids. And there's two little tiny clowns. And then the one, the snake charmer from Arabia, he forgot his basket and his snake got away. So he can't do that act that he was going to do. <laughs> <laughs> and so now I'm going on, and we've been talking with Geraldine Hurst of Ottumwa, and now I'm going to talk with another woman from Ottumwa. And That's thank you. Good. Thank you. Mrs. Ed Halk from Ottumwa does work with shells. Mrs. Halk, when did you get started doing this? About 1961. Do you pick up the shells in Florida, or do you uh, have to use regular shells? We uh, pick up an quite a lot of shells, but we seldom pick up enough of one size and one color to make an arrangement, so we have to buy them just to get a large number of shells and the same size. How do you go about getting the inspiration and then carrying out a theme for, well, take any one of these? Well, uh, they, the inspiration sometimes comes to me just by something I see in nature or something I see that uh, attracts my attention and then I work it out but never in duplicate I never duplicate it but I'll work it out in my own way and change it until you'd never recognize anything if I get the inspiration that way and sometimes it comes to me through a song or sometimes through um, well at night when I'm lying awake the uh, inspiration will come to me and uh, just the same as it would in poetry that comes to me in the night and I jump up real quickly and uh, make a sketch. But uh, it's just uh, creative and something that uh, is just a talent that the Lord gave me. How long does it take you to actually develop one of these? Oh, a week or if I worked at it. Uh, it's quite, uh, you make the, prepare the flowers and then uh, 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 and that takes hours and hours, you know, to do, to do that. Oh, you work weeks and weeks on one large arrangement and into months on some of the large ones I have at home. Do you sell them? No, I don't sell them. Why? Because I can't part with one of my children. <laughs> uh, do, you, do you do other crafts? Many kinds, many kinds of craft. For instance? Well, I, I just make about everything I see, <laughs> but uh, I tat and uh, uh, I write, and um, oh, I just make everything. I use, a, uh, I have quite a, a display of uh, things I have made out of uh, used greeting cards that people give me, and uh, they are very attractive. I have many things like that. Do I dare ask what your house looks like and how many cans of shells you must have? Well, I have uh, over 60 gallon in the basement. <laughs> and I have uh, 
Well, the house is full. <laughs> so that keeps you busy. My living room is, uh, has glass cases built in that they're under glass, which is very nice. And uh, I show them, and I'm always happy to show people that cares to call me before they come. Do I dare ask how old you are? I'm 73. No, 74. And Mrs. Ed Houck is uh, doing part of her, or showing part of her work at the Iowa Senior Citizens Arts Festival that was held in the Hotel Fort Des Moines. Many beautiful things, and I congratulate you for participating. Thank you, and it was a privilege of me to, to me to be asked. What does this symbol mean? Well, Dorcas, this is the international symbol for accessibility, and wherever you might travel in the world, in a wheelchair, this shows you that wherever this is displayed, that that place is adapted for your use, and that you would have complete access to all the facilities in that building. Now, I think perhaps we have been uh, most aware of it uh, in restrooms at this particular time, as far as the general public. I think that's probably true, although uh, hopefully it's becoming much more widespread in its usage so that actually people in wheelchairs can take a lot of the problems out of their travel. Just everything that a person might use in his normal activities of daily living, everything. Now, Rolf Carlson is executive director of the Easter Seal Society for Crippled Children and Adults of Iowa Incorporated. That's an awfully long time. It sure is. <laughs> now, tell me a little bit more what we're really talking about here. As he said, we're talking about the restrooms, but uh, much more. Well, just for example, the person who wants to go to the post office needs to be able to get in not only to see the inside of the building, but to do the business that he needs to do to carry on his daily life. The person who wants to go to church on Sunday certainly has a right to that opportunity. It's guaranteed under the Constitution. Now, you were telling me a little while ago a, a story of a gentleman who perhaps his church absence had been misinterpreted. Yeah, a real fine fellow who's now in his late 50s who wrote me after he had been at camp and said that he'd dearly love to go to church every Sunday. And I'm sure the minister would have been delighted to see him. But he hated to embarrass his neighbors by asking them to carry him up the steps in a wheelchair. Now, this is not something that's done intentionally. And consequently, when we contacted the church, they were certainly agreeable to putting in a ramp so that this fellow could go and worship the Lord as he wanted to every Sunday. And now this affects not only uh, people in wheelchairs, but we're talking about people uh, that have other sorts of walking disabilities, don't we? Oh, yes. Any number of people. Those on crutches. We have the unseen handicapped, you know. People we don't realize. People who have uh, had cardiac problems, coronary problems, who really can't master steps very well, who have gait problems. And all of these people will have a tremendous amount to give their community if we'll just help them have the opportunity to give it. Now, as I said, we're talking about steps, uh, this sort of thing. We're talking about the one step that it takes to get into your home or the one step up in the park or uh, uh, all this sort of thing, too. Oh, absolutely. Uh, many buildings, for example, that are architecturally accessible wonder why we don't say, oh, you're great. And we find that they've provided fine, ample parking lots, but the one curb over which the wheelchair can't climb by itself and the people can't get up to the building to use its accessibility. So that it's important as far as a, hu a whole community to be concerned about the corners at the sidewalks as well as then getting into the walk that goes up to the building. Yes, that's very important. There are a lot of housewives on crutches, in wheelchairs, cardiacs, and so on, who would love to come spend money with the merchants downtown, but can't because they can't get up the curbs from the parking lots or crossing the streets. Uh, a very ordinary daily problem, for example, most of us, I think, have to go to the bathroom from time to time in the day, 
And for that person who is handicapped and needs a special type of bathroom accommodation, they almost have to plan their shopping trips according to how long they estimate they can go without having to visit the restroom. I'm sure that the mother who was having a back problem and perhaps could not lift that uh, stroller up would be glad to have a place that they could push it up a ramp and nobody perhaps knows the mother has a back problem. That's right, and it's amazing, Dorcas, how many stores have put in ramps finally and then found that the major portion of the traffic, handicapped and otherwise, use the ramp rather than any steps that are right next to the ramp. Now we think of children in water fountains. What about other people that uh, are not quite like you and I? <laughs> well, of course, we're just children at heart. <laughs> Uh, no, this is right. Uh, really, the person with a disability has a right to use all of the publicly uh, sponsored things. They like to go into auditoriums, they like to go to concerts and so on, and they enjoy having a drink of water. They may need to call home so that the phones ought to be at a convenient height. Uh, they would love to give the dimes to the telephone company. Uh, once again, the restrooms are a big consideration in the use of recreational type public buildings because uh, for the large part, people didn't take these things into consideration when most of them were built. Now going back to the telephone and the water fountain thing, are there ways to design these so that they would be accessible to all people? Oh yes, uh, there are ways and there are specifications that are available to people. Uh, the biggest problem really is calling to the attention of the builders and the architects before they are in the actual blueprinting stage, when they're in the planning stages. Then the cost is really uh, almost the same cost. Uh, in some cases it could be less, in many cases it might be a little more. But in terms of the traffic using that building and the uh, opportunity to be of real service to your fellow man, uh, the cost is a very minor thing. What about designing our own homes for our use or for our friends' use? I think it's critical that we take these same things into consideration because one thing none of us knows is when we might have occasion to need our house to be completely accessible architecturally. I know of a case in the not too far distant past of a man who built a beautiful $60,000 tri-level home. Just a wonderful place with all the conveniences and about a year later was injured in an automobile accident, needed to be in a wheelchair the rest of his life, and had to sell his home to make another one that he could operate and live a, a consistent daily life in. Well, of course, it can make a difference as far as how much of a host and hostess we are, too, as far as our friends. Absolutely. Where is this information available? If somebody really wants to know how they can uh, oh, perhaps make some of the changes in their home, their church, the community. Oh, we'd be delighted to uh, send the information that we have, Dorcas. Uh, in addition, there are any number of resources who uh, make special adapted equipment, uh, like the claw grip uh, reaching pincers for the housewife who may need to get into a high cupboard that she can't reach from her wheelchair. Of course, it'd be much better to build them that way in the first place. Uh, but. We'd be delighted to send whatever helpful information we can. We'd be delighted to show films about accessibility and to just be of whatever help we can to people who are in the planning stages. And we have been talking with Rolf Carlson, and he is the executive director of the Easter Seal Society for Crippled Children and Adults of uh, Iowa Incorporated. And the post office box is 4002 Des Moines, Iowa. And thank you very much. Well, thank you for coming out.